Okay. Right, right through there. Yeah. I got you. Uh, thank you, I have two. I have three. I have two. I have that one. Yeah, there's a map coming. <laughs> Well, it is. Now, Wilson is my assistant. Santa White. Dave, do you have three? I have two, but I need a map. Okay. Wow, that's Isn't that pretty. Isn't that pretty? Yeah, okay. Thank you. I forgot. I'll take a map too. So there we go. <laughs> yeah. As usual, Wilson has showed up unprepared. Uh -huh. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. Well, it's kind of a, a double edged sword here. I live in the world of pictures and images. <laughs> <laughs> you all may want to say the Jesus prayer. Jesus, 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 help me, help me, help me. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> we start. If we're good to go. Yeah. Yep. Okay, good morning. Good morning. <laughs> For those of you that don't know me, I'm Wilson Campbell, and I'm going to be your discussion leader this morning. And we're going to look at chapter 15, the end of this journey through the Old Testament, and maybe the beginning of the journey to the New Testament. So it's an exciting place to be. Uh, the Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O God of peace, who has taught us that in returning and rest we shall be saved, quietness and confidence shall be our strength. Lord, you have taught us that when two or three are gathered together in your name, that you will be in the midst of us. Thank you for your presence with us this morning as we gather together in this study group about the return of the Jews to Judea after the Babylonian captivity and rebuilding your holy temple, as well as the story of Esther. Grant us knowledge of your truth and help us to hear and understand your voice in the material that we're studying and sharing with each other today. By the might of your spirit, lift us, we pray, to your presence where we may still be still and know that you are our God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. You've got three handouts with you, and we're talking about a period of time of about 200 years from 600 B.C. to 400 B.C., and what you've got in front of you is a rough timeline. It's rough. I'm trying to pull it together from pieces. There's uh, there's information on the front and the back of that. Uh, and then you have a map of the return, exile and return. And I think this in one page sum, sums it up about as good as you can you can find. It shows the the uh, exodus or the uh, exile and then the three waves of the return. And that's kind of hard to keep track of as you're reading this about who went where when, but uh, the time period begins. And then there's a supplemental package of some information that I thought might be helpful. I love the icon that we're using today on the, on the front of this, the scrolls, because of Part of the uh, the uh, beauty of the uh, exile was Jeremiah told them, don't just sit here, use it to your advantage. And in 70 years, you'll, the prediction is you'll go home. And it was almost that 70 years period. So they, uh, 
you'll have a little taste of what we do in EFM around this table this morning because I've asked some wonderful people to help me tell this story. And uh, I think that's the, uh, the point of it. I, I Last time, Louise did a great job of uh, telling us about the book of Daniel and the prophecies that were involved in that. And then the Ezekiel story. And um, as we've as we go forward, we'll begin to see that. Usually what we do is uh, talk about the icons, and, and I'm going to save that for uh, Ezra, and I'll play a recording at the end, because it's a wonderful way of telling this whole story from Abraham all the way to where we are now in Babylon, and uh, I don't know, I find these epic poems that are scattered throughout the Old and New Testament just be a, to be a wonderful summary. And there's some Psalms that do it. There's this one I thought was very powerful. Uh, to set the stage, I'd like to ask Sharon to uh, uh, read a passage uh, that kind of tells about the destruction. Uh, I'll pass some pictures around as she's... Uh, I live in pictures. I don't... Uh, and then I take the images and then try to fill in the details. So I've got a lot of missing pieces, but uh, this kind of goes along and tells the story. And, and I'll pass these to Sharon reads this passage from. Okay, where do I start? 17? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, each pillar was 27 feet high. The bronze capital on top of one pillar was four and a half feet high and was decorated with a network and pomegranates of bronze all around. The other pillar with its network was similar. The commander of the guard took his prisoners, Sariah the chief priest, Zephaniah the priest next in rank, and the three doorkeepers. Of those still in the city, he took the officer in charge of the fighting men and five royal advisors. He also took the secretary, who was chief, chief officer in charge of conscripting the people of the land and 60 of his men who were found in the city. Nebuchadnezzar, the commander, took them all and brought them to the king of Babylon at Ribla. There at Ribla, in the land of Hamas, the king had them executed. So Judah went into captivity away from her land. Thank you. That kind of sets the stage. What what was happening? This is a chart that I love. And I blew it up and I was amazed that it uh, came out so you could really read it. This is the whole story of the temple. And it starts with the Ark of the Covenant. Then David buys the land, but God told him that he wasn't going to build the temple because of his sin with Bathsheba. But he collected all the stuff. He collected a lot of the bronze and a lot of the things that eventually wound up in the temple. And then Solomon builds the temple. And then there's some, and what we're going to talk about, the first temple was destroyed. And then we're talking about these two boxes, but it takes it all the way down to when the Romans destroyed the temple in 70 AD. So this is really the story and the building is part of that, that whole important process. And it was such a, a big uh, deal when they destroyed Solomon's temple. The, the other thing that we use a lot in EFM is a timeline book and I'll pass this around just so that you can all the ephemers have seen this but mm -hmm. <laughs> there's a wonderful section in here on the uh, the temple and it was a magnificent And all the all the pieces of all the worship things that were in it that becomes significant in this story because of the uh, 
But this picture is something that I just think extraordinary. The, the beauty of the building itself was just beyond belief. And, and I think everybody has seen these, but we'll pass those around. So just kind of keep that in the back of your <laughs> mind as we go through this story. If you'll turn to the page in your handout, Psalm 137. I've asked Tony to set the stage with reading Psalm 137 and then uh, uh, the first part of the first lamentation of, of Jeremiah. The uh, Psalm sort of, they've packed them up. They've walked four months to get to Babylon and they're sitting by the river and they're saying, now what? Who are we? We've lost everything. And Psalm 137 does a great job of tying that together. So uh, before we start, though, I would like uh, uh, Tony just to set the stage with a little piece out of the Ezekiel's dry bones story, because that's what this is all about. The hand of the Lord was upon me and he brought me out by the spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He asked me, Son man, can these bones live? I said, O oh, sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Therefore prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Oh, my people, I'm going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from them. It's a wonderful story of resurrection and exile and resurrection. And that's kind of the theme of all of this return to Jerusalem. And now, now, Tony, if you can read Psalm 137, that would be. By the rivers of Babylon, we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. There on the poplars, we hung our harps, for there our captors asked us for song. Our tormentors, demanded songs of joy. They said, sing us one of the songs of Zion. How can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a foreign land? If I forget you, Jerusalem, may I right hand forget its skill. May my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. If I do not remember you, if I do not consider Jerusalem my highest joy. Remember, Lord, what the Edomites did on the day of Jerusalem's fall. Tear it down, they cried. Tear it down to its foundations. Daughter Babylon, doomed to destruction, happy is the one who repays you according to what you have done to us. Happy is the one who seizes your infants and dashes them against the rock. Sometimes the Psalms are the greatest inspirational way of telling a story. And I don't know, sitting there on the banks of the, the river in Babylon, uh, it gives a sense that who are we? We're lost. We don't even know who we are. And that becomes a very important theme as Jeremiah told them. 
don't waste your time, turn it into something good in 70 years, you'll go back. And that's kind of the power of the, of the prophets. These graphs that are, I'm using come out of the Dure illustrations of the Bible. And this is something that's kind of happened. We have talked about aha moments and these, these in the book, don't look anything like the etchings when you see them in real person. But I took these to the blueprint shop and they blew them up and boy, they did they come out. These are more like the real etching and, that are than in the book. This one is what the destruction, after they pulled out and sent everybody to Babylon, Jerusalem was totally destroyed. I mean, it was there. It, the, Gates were burned, the brock piles were there. I mean, that's quite a story. And I think this does as good a job telling the image of what we're looking at. So with that, I'm gonna to ask Tony to read just the first part of uh, the Lamentations of Jeremiah number one. It just sort of says, this is what Jerusalem looked like uh, when it was sitting there after the destruction. So. How deserted lies the city, once so full of people. How like a widow is she who once was great among the nations. She who was queen among the provinces has now become a slave. That, uh, we'll come back when we talk about the this, uh, Nehemiah. Uh, rebuilding the walls. I've asked Father David to talk about this graph in your handout a little bit. There was something amazing that happened when they were sitting in, in Jerusalem. They, they decided to pull all these oral stories together and try to get these things down on paper in the, during the exile. So yeah, and uh, yeah, you sprang this on me right before class started. So. <laughs> That's what you get for taking a week off. <laughs> it's been too long since I've been out of seminary to remember most of this stuff. I don't know, if, how many of y'all are familiar with the, the phrase Second Temple of Judaism? I had not really heard that term a great deal until I got to seminary, maybe heard it for the first time. So, Again, the, the first temple was constructed by Solomon. The Babylonians destroyed it. And then after uh, after certain uh, after 70 years or so, uh, the Jews, uh, the people of uh, Judea returned to Jerusalem. Uh, and Jerusalem is just, it was one of the great cities. And now it's, it's completely destroyed. I mean, it's just devastating. There's nothing left. And you hear a little bit of that uh, in the last bit that Tony read from Lamentation about just uh, the the incredible destruction uh, of what was formerly this great capital of uh, the uh, people of Israel. So one of the so they began construction of a new temple, and basically that whole period between the beginning of that construction until the destruction of that second temple, uh, which happened pretty soon after Jesus' death. So I think the second temple was destroyed around 80, 70, 70, 80, yeah. 70. Um, is that the period known as second temple Judaism. Uh, and during that period, especially towards the beginning, uh, there are a couple of fundamental questions that are being wrestled with. Um, one of the most important ones is if we are God's chosen people, how did this ever even happen? How is it that the Babylonians wound up prevailing over us and destroying uh, not only our city and our culture, but our holy temple? Um, this was kind of unimaginable. And the kind of oversimplistic way of describing it is that the, the answer they come up with is that this was God's punishment for their unfaithfulness to the covenant. Um, so faithfulness to the covenant is reward, rewarded with blessing. Uh, unfaithfulness to the covenant is rewarded with curse. This is known as the Deuteronomistic uh, theological perspective, and it dominates uh, a, a whole lot of the 
uh, scriptures we have in the Hebrew Bible. So you've got oral stories, and you, you see a lot of these described here, a lot of these oral traditions that had been handed down for hundreds and hundreds of years. And there, I'm sure that there were little fragments written on goat skin, but for the most part, these were oral stories that were handed down for generations and generations and generations. It's during this, the beginning of the simple Second Temple period that people start really pulling this stuff together and writing it down in a kind of a more unified, uh, organized fashion. And so the people who are writing these down, uh, we call the, the people who are redacting uh, these oral histories. And so all of these stories that have been handed down were then told through the perspective of the leaders during the Second Temple period. And so they, you can see this theme of kind of covenant faithfulness, blessing, unfaithfulness, curse. You see this occur over and over again. Uh, and so that's one of the reasons that this theme is so dominant uh, throughout the Hebrew Bible. Um, so it's really important to understand there are a lot of different perspectives that were originally represented. We can still sometimes tease some of those apart you know, if you've ever studied Genesis, you've probably heard of the Yahwist and the priestly author and these different perspectives that are, are uh, we're able to kind of perceive in there. But almost all of this stuff was redacted during the Second Temple period. And so it's that's an important perspective to keep in mind. I don't know if that's... that. Yeah, no, that, that's absolutely perfect. I don't perfect. know if this is off the wall, but I... I don't know how long ago it was, but there was quite a, I guess, to do about finding the Dead Sea Scroll. Mm -hmm. Has that revealed anything above and beyond what we already know, what we had at hand before we found the Dead Sea Scrolls? I, I don't remember ever hearing anything that said, hey, but we learned something after looking at this. I, any new revelations that I have? Well, there's, there are, and I've never really studied the Dead Sea Scrolls a great deal, but there are pieces of literature in there that we that we didn't have access to before, and they are not being told through a Christian perspective. So much of what we have from that period is written from that perspective, and this was a not not a, a Christian group. Um, it was a you know probably a similar messianic uh, Jewish group, people who are resisting the wrong end. So yes, it's it's important to have some stories from that area, era that are told from a different perspective. Again, if, if you want to understand, if you want to know what redaction is all about, just look at the four Gospels, each of them written about, you know, the same person, but from a very different perspective and with very different concerns. And that gives you an idea. And you think about you know, if we were to see an event happen and each of us were to write it down, you would come out with very, very different stories of what happened based on our own Thank you, David. The um, big event, as you get to chapter 15 in the path, yeah. Historical, this is just the most amazing thing that ever happened. King Cyrus says, you can pack up and go back. And uh, uh, I've asked Bob to read that first section about King Cyrus and then talk a little bit. Of, and again, this etching shows Cyrus and he's taken all the vessels out of the temple. This is amazing. They put all, all this stuff off put it in the warehouse in Babylon, and Cyrus says, okay, you guys can go home, and by the way, here's all your stuff. Take it back, and it goes back to the temple. I, that's just totally amazing to me, but I've asked Bob to tell us about Cyrus. Well, I never do things exactly like I'm asked to do them. <laughs> <laughs> so when I started preparing for this, the first thing I tried to do is go back and put it in chronological order which is almost the same as this. We got the handout we got. But 
stories like the story of Daniel, I never put that together with the Babylonian exile until we talked about it in here. I didn't I didn't know that that was connected. So looking back about 600 BC, 605 actually, the exile started and actually Daniel was taken over to Babylon and he was 15 years old. So he existed almost all the way through the Babylonian uh, exile. Then in 586, Judah fell in Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed. And as Dave said, we normally think about destruction of the temple, but the city was destroyed. Um, and then Cyrus came to power in 559. So uh, he was in about 25 years after uh, the temple was destroyed. So I'm thinking about the role that Cyrus played in the tradition of the Jewish world. And it's pretty amazing. Uh, you know, I think there are times when people cross into our lives that make a difference as individuals. Historically, you've got somebody like Churchill who had the wherewithal and happened exactly at the right time and probably saved the world. And then you've got Cyrus, who was a king, a Babylonian king, who had done all this bad things to the Jews. And he said, you're free. What a big deal. I mean, it, 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 without, let's take Cyrus out of the picture. What does it look like? You know, perhaps the Jewish tradition died right there with that. So it's pretty amazing. So I, I just think he's a guy that gets a lot of credit in my mind. So in the first year of King Cyrus of Persia, in order that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be accomplished, the Lord stirred up the spirit of King Cyrus of Persia so that he sent a herald throughout all his kingdom and also in a written edict declared. Thus says King Cyrus of Persia, and then he gives credit to the real hero in this. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has ordered me to build him a house at Jerusalem in Judah. Any of those among you who are of this of his people, may their God be with them, are now permitted to go to Jerusalem in Judah and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem, and let all survivors in whatever place they reside be assisted by the people of their place with silver and gold, with goods and with animals, besides free will offerings of the house in Jerusalem. The heads of the families of Judah and Benjamin, and the priests and Levites, everyone whose spirit God had stirred, got ready to go up and rebuild the house of the Lord in Jerusalem. All their neighbors aided them with silver vessels, with gold, with goods from animals, and with valuable gifts. Besides all that was freely offered. King Cyrus himself brought out the vessels of the house of the Lord that Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had carried away from Jerusalem and placed in the house of his gods. So a small group of people, only a portion of those who had gone into exile, returned to Jerusalem bringing with them the gifts of their neighbors and King Cyrus. The city was in utter destruction and ruin. The temple had been completely obliterated. Seven months after their return, the people gathered in Jerusalem and the priest and Levite constructed an altar on the ruins of the old one and began offering sacrifices according to the rules passed down to Moses. After months of offering sacrifices and gathering supplies, they began to lay the foundation for a new temple. So from the from the time that the temple was destroyed to the time that they started rebuilding was almost 50 years. And of course the people had been back a while from on the exile, but there were very few people that came back that went over to begin with because of the 50 year period. And if you give 20 years to each generation, uh, 
he might have been a child and gone over and came back as a, an elder, maybe. You would have had to have been, if you were 10, you would have had to be uh, 70 or 80 to come when you came back. So there was a whole new bunch of people, but they had their tradition that they had carried out because they, they were more or less, if I understand it right, they could go yeah. under house arrest in Babylon. And they were permitted some freedom, so they I'm sure they had their own uh storytelling and worships and that sort of thing. That's that's about it. One of the big things that happened with Cyrus. Historically, there is a it's called the Cyrus cylinder. And those that have been through uh EFM, the Collins book does a great job in about four pages of retelling the Ezra and Nehemiah story. This cylinder is so important because it's the first historical declaration of human rights that was actually, and you can see it. He, he talks about the importance of people having their own traditions. And it's amazing. And the thing, I'm, I'll pass this around. You can take a look at it. This is, it's in the British Museum. Someday, I think the people of the world are going to say, give us our stuff back. But, <laughs> uh, but what's amazing about this is if you go to the United Nations and right outside the Security Council Auditorium, there's a replica of this, and you can almost touch it. And I'll pass that around. What's it, why that's important is the very first document that the United Nations produced in 1948 <clears throat> was a universal declaration of human rights. And it's such a powerful document. And Eleanor Roosevelt led the, she was one of the delegates and she led the, for the putting this together and, it's the only time the entire General Assembly has ever given a standing ovation to one of the workers, and, and it's a wonderful story. I'll pass that around, and I'll start one of these over here. The uh, But this Declaration of Human Rights, it's a very, very powerful story, and it's kind of neat to see how these historical things come together and the ties that go with them. The... Um, the next story in the uh, half book is rebuilding the temple. And as you might imagine, the story says they started the temple and they lay, laid the foundation stone. There we go. How about this? This one's like a this one's like a set for the Metropolitan Opera. There's, <laughs> they're just these these are kind of like the sets for a big drama. And here they are, and they've cleared away all the rubble. I mean, this was just a pile of junk sitting around and it had been there for 70 years and I mean to start this thing they had to get rid of all the stuff so they could lay the cornerstone again so I just love the energy in this picture uh, and they got the foundation laid and they have this big uh, wonderful celebration and they come back to some of their traditions and what did you think about when you read that story about rebuilding the temple what what hit you about what we read in the path book? What struck me is it took them 20 years. And I think at the beginning, they were rebuilding their houses. They didn't have time to go build the temple back. But uh, I, I'm not sure Cyrus was still the king then, but one of either Cyrus or his replacement said, enough of this foolishness. We're going to rebuild that temple, and we are going to pay the bill. And that's in that book. And that that was a new story to me. I love that. Uh, that that's the beautiful. 
the thing is, there's language. You have Cyrus's uh, successor, Darius the first, and then you get in Ezra, and he says, whatever this guy's name was, Artaxerxes. Well, that's a. There weren't that many kings. They were talking about the same guy. Uh, it's just a different language. So you have you, when you're trying to put this together and piece the timeline, you have to realize that. And that's one of the beautiful things about this: the language issue uh, is that uh, in Persia or in Babylon and Persia, the main language was Aramaic, and in uh, Jerusalem, I mean the Hebrew language, and of course, as time goes on, the Greek language. So you've got all these languages. It's kind of like the tap Tower of Babel, and uh, understanding the translation is a, is a, a a difficult thing. But I I think this story is that, and this isn't linear at all. Uh, uh, talk about Persia. And one of the main stories in the path book is the story of Esther. And I've asked uh, Barb and Lee to kind of fill us in on that. So if you do that, I'd appreciate it. Not good, but just recalling the king. He was kind of a horrible king. He was kind of a drunk. And uh, very egocentric. Egocentric. You know, liked to have parties and festivals. And uh, they had a 180 day festival at the beginning of Esther. And uh, and he decides that his wife, the queen, wanted her to put the crown on and walk around naked. And let everybody look at her. Well, she would, She didn't think that was something she wanted to do. And uh, so she was banished, I guess, to the harem or whatever. Because he had a lot of women. And uh, so then then he, uh, he goes looking for a new queen. And uh, so he, he puts an edict out and they gather... Actually, they kind of go around and wrestle up all the most attractive women. And they spend a year pampering them with all kinds of uh, treatments to make them more beautiful. And then they're gradually paraded into the king for him to look at them. And uh, he's going to choose out the, the, the most attractive one. So Esther happens to be the most attractive woman at that time. So, so she, uh, she, uh, he takes the fancy to her the first time he sees her. <laughs> you want to pick up from there a little bit or not, or, or not? <laughs> uh, Thank you for putting well, it in layman's language. Oh, for <laughs> you did, is, is that okay or not? Or is it yeah, great. bad? But the villain in the story is Haman, and he was, um, a, uh, I guess, a wealthy man that was part of the king's court and um, really wanted to be honored and lifted up, and he insisted that everybody bow down to him, and uh, Mordecai wouldn't do that. Mordecai refused to bow down to him, um, so Haman was not happy about this and, and wanted to destroy Mordecai and all of Mordecai's people, which is all the Jewish people. If I remember correctly. And, um, yeah, that's right. but again, the king is, he's so easily swayed. I mean, you get him drunk and you ask him for a favor and, you know. You get the ring out and stamp it. You know? Yeah, and doesn't, doesn't think things through, doesn't really investigate. Oh yeah, that's a good idea. Let's do that. But of course, he's drunk. So <laughs> the other thing that's interesting is that whatever he, whatever he mandates, can never be rescinded. So you know he can make some really bad decisions and stamp it, and then all this you know. Yeah. But Mordecai had helped the king had uh, had, had uh, reported on something that was going on and and made it 
actually protected the king. And so the king wanted to, had forgotten about him, but wanted to honor him. So he asked, hey, well, what, what, what's the best way I can honor someone? What's, what's, what should I do to someone for someone that I want to honor? And Haman's thinking, oh, this is for me. And it wasn't, it was for Mordecai. So um, <clears throat> Haman doesn't like the fact that Mordecai is raising up in the ranks and, and he now he feels overlooked. So he tricks the king really into making this proclamation that um, all of the Jews are going to be slaughtered. He's just going to wipe out all the people. And he doesn't realize that Esther is a Jew. He doesn't, he, she has kept her, her heritage kind of hidden. I think it goes out that, that, that people get paid for doing it too. Oh, I mean. Right. And they set a day that this, on this day, all the Jews are to be slaughtered. Yeah. <clears throat> and as far as Esther goes, she, Mordecai advises her that, you know, she's in a position to, to help. So she's in a position to, to talk to the king and to, to make a difference. And um, she's hesitant at first. Um, but so she starts, she starts, she goes and, and throwing these feasts. I think there were seven for seven days. She was um, put on these big lavish uh, feasts for the king and for his court. And so um, I, the king is ready to grant her whatever she wants because he's she's made him very happy with um, all the attention. And so she asked him to to change the the um, the proclamation that he'd made because if he does that, then she she will also be killed. That her she will be grieved because all of her people will be killed. So the tables get turned on Haman. Well, he, she doesn't change the proclamation. He makes another proclamation, right? Because he can't change it. So that then you, you end up with with two battles going on. You got two proclamations. One, the people are, are told that they're supposed to kill the Jews. And then you have another proclamation saying the Jews are going to kill them. So so they, they end up that that uh, the 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 the, uh, the Jews kill seventy five thousand people, you know, and and uh, and they kill Haman's sons all 10 sons and after they kill them they hang them on the the they hang them up kind of like in that hulu show what's the name of the the where, where they you, you know the one where they the where they you know which i'm talking about <laughs> <laughs> one in gilead 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 oh 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 in gilead you know where they do something wrong and then they hang the them on the wall tail. yeah the hands may tell they hang them on the wall you know, on the scaffolding after they're dead, you know, which, 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 which freaked me out. I mean, you know, <laughs> it was a, it was disgrace and dishonor to do that rather than have a proper burial. They get hung on the wall, <laughs> but, um, a powerful but, incentive to not but, break the rules. Right. Not break the rules. <laughs> and always do what's going to, whatever's going to make the King happy. But, but all of these characters through this whole story, it's like, it, to me, they all seem like caricatures. Like not real people, but just these like playing a role. Yeah, playing um, a role. Yeah, but also like really exaggerated. Uh, um, like the king is is like really vain and really to extreme. Yeah, yeah, to an extreme, and and Esther just happens to be the most beautiful woman, so she just happens to be in the right place at the right time. Yeah, it was like she a is. Miss America pageant. You know, <laughs> I mean, that's maybe where they got the inspiration for it. You know? <laughs> One of the beautiful things that comes out of this is this feast of triumph. And it's kind of the Mardi Gras of the Jewish people. And they can use well, and the Halloween, too, because they all they yeah. dress up in costumes. And uh, this year it was uh, March the 6th to the 7th. And it goes from the evening of the sixth to the evening of the seventh. And they give presents and you're supposed to drink a little bit more than you normally do. Drink excessively. Excessively, <laughs> because that's what the king did, you know what I mean? And 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 God kind of worked through that, you know, to give them what they want. Supposed to, and then you're supposed to, to pass out, you know, and, and kind of dream that, you know, your enemy has been defeated. I mean, it's 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 kind of, I mean, 
and there's special foods they eat and uh and it still goes on today i mean that's after all these years you know it, it was in in the end of end of esther it said it's supposed to be a, a two-day festival yeah, thanks you get a little bit of the dynamic in efm because it's fun to have a couple in the EFM because you begin to get both sides of the story often. <laughs> the dynamic of the dialogue is just wonderful. <laughs> yeah. It's the uh it's every every week I walk out of here just totally amazed at what I learned from both of them. So thanks. The in your handout, you've got a piece a chart of all the piece of the uh, Jews. And and we saw one of the things that happened after they laid the foundation stone is they actually celebrate Passover for the first time. And that, I think that's one of the powerful stories. My sense is, as I go through it, that wasn't done in Babylon. It may have been a little bit, but it wasn't the official policy. And the kind of the reconnecting with the whole Passover story was an important part that came came out of this process. The after the temple is done and and uh, in, in, on Bob's chart uh, when when it's rebuilt, they have to Ezra leads a group of people, uh, and I think this is one of the things that. He suffers on what to do with the people left in Judea is that he says, I've got to tell them they've got to divorce their foreign wives. And to me, I, I that if anything really bothered me, that I I think out of this whole thing, that that whole story of Ezra. So there's a process where, and this is to evoke uh Ezra reading the law back to the people so they can hear it for the first time again. And the, the Moses and the tablets, I mean, Ezra was quite a scholar and a scribe, and he knew the story all the way uh, by heart. And he stands up for in a rainstorm and tells, tells the story and says, this is, this is the way it is. And so they re- they re uh, promise that they're going to follow the laws of, and it's complicated. I'm going to try to summarize it, but maybe essentially, what they do is say that we're going to have a new covenant with with. Uh, with God and we're going to do right things and we're going to adhere to his laws and uh, I don't know it's it's quite a, a powerful story of reconnection the uh, it seems like the theme that rolls through all of this is it's just a sometimes a vicious cycle there's a period where they agree that they're going to follow God's commands, and then they go off on a tangent, and it's a process of God coming very patient with everybody, uh, coming and and they need a rescue, and then a return to following God's laws, and this is the big story of the rescue, but there's responsibility on almost a new covenant uh between the people and and uh i don't know did anybody have any thoughts about uh what was happening with this part of the story if, if you uh assume and you, you say to assume that during the 50 years of exile 40 to 50 years of exile that they did not have education training even worship i don't know what they were doing but in your, your three generations past that, uh, you would have to go back and start with the Ten Commandments and re-educate all the younger people mm -hmm. in the tradition. Yeah. So that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And I found that really interesting. 
um, through BFM finding out that that's when uh, Torah was written down. Mm -hmm. It had all been an oral tradition up until then, but all of a sudden they're in danger of losing their culture. Yeah, they sure. could they could they could be assimilated and be gone. And and it was important to to them that that they maintain their identity as a people, and so that all of that got written down uh, for the first time. Uh, I did want to find out too that I thought it was interesting that the two festivals on the list here that were not part of Torah, that were not part of what Moses had instructed them to do, are um, Hanukkah and Purim. Uh, those were added later as, as special holidays. Um, Hanukkah is the, the Feast of Lights for, um, after the Maccabean revolt when they uh, they reclaimed the temple and cleansed it and uh, did a rededication of the only had enough oil for one night, but it lasted seven nights, so that was a miracle. And so they celebrate uh, Hanukkah and then Purim, the celebration of um, the Jews being saved uh, by Queen Esther. So, um, but those are not actually part of the law, part of the original tradition. Well, and I had a, a question that maybe Dave can help us with. Uh, you know, Jerusalem is in the southern kingdom, and those are the tribes of Benjamin and Judah, and it's called Judah. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Okay, so were all the people that were in the Babylonian exile from Judah, primarily? Yes, because the northern kingdoms had been already conquered and destroyed by the Assyrians. Okay. So there really so wasn't a whole lot. At left. some point in time in this story, it talks about them going back to Israel. And Israel is the name of the Norman Northern Kingdom, right? And actually, what they do is they just sort of change slowly to where instead of referring to Judah, they're talking about that the people went back to Israel. Mm -hmm. uh, things like that. Well, Israel, remember, as a kingdom and as a geographical entity you know, okay. expands and contracts. So, you know, saying what Israel is is kind of a difficult thing to do. So um, it's okay to go back, and, even though they're from Judah, to say they're going back to Israel. Mm -hmm. Okay. But the Northern Kingdom is specifically called Israel. What's the Northern Kingdom called? You can call it Israel too. You can call it the Northern well, Kingdom. You can call it the Ten Tribes. Israel. What's that? I thought it was normally referred to as Israel and Judah. Uh huh. I think it, it is in some, you know, depending on who it is that's talking about it. But I, I don't think now we would re we just refer to Israel and it's a completely but different geographic. Problem is, Jerusalem is the people where they worship. So that's why they began worshiping Samaria, and that's why we didn't well. That's why I know the Jews have been Samaria because of that situation in this place. Well, as long as you're referring to an area, that's fine. Yeah, I, guess. <laughs> I thought it was interesting too that not all of the Jewish people were taken into captivity. There was a remnant left behind, mm -hmm. and it set up this situation that we had with Samaria. Those are people who right. had, had stayed, but had. That but the people that came back from Jerusalem didn't want to accept them as real Jews because they didn't get into, go into exile, mm -hmm. and so it set up this this conflict between the Samaritans and the and the Judeans, and also that eventually leads to the situation we're in now with the Palestinians. Mm -hmm. That's their homeland. Yeah. You know? <laughs> right, right, but. I, I think that, that it strikes me that everything we've been talking about is things are either repetitive or they repeat themselves again and again in modern times. We just look around and we can just put different names on them. And so we'll be looking at the same things that were going on then. And, and, and I find that totally remarkable. Uh, I was just sitting here thinking, like, just on, on the, the, the new covenant. Why is it always a new covenant when the covenant itself was the same? Really, reaffirmation, yeah, yeah. I mean, they commit. Is it a semantic difference in terms of calling it new or something like that, or or because it really isn't new? 
It's like saying, hey, this is what we should have been living by all along. So we're going to start going back to it. I have a comment on what Barb was saying. There's something right here that I highlighted that I thought was interesting. While God was powerfully present in the rebuilt temple, and with those who returned to Jerusalem, God did not abandon those who were scattered abroad. So it's 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 kind of the point that Barb made, the Samaritans that were in Jerusalem wanted to be part of the rebuilding, and they were, were told, no, you can't be. Well, there was the beginning of that divide where you know uh mm -hmm. and it led. The whole thing. And I think Jesus brings it back when he meets the woman at the well and says, this is bigger than all of us and you're all part of this story. I think the there's lots of this chapter. They do a beautiful job in this book of summarizing the, uh, the whole story of the icons. And the, the, the retelling of that story, and it starts on about page 198, 199. We don't have enough. I've got a recording of it, but uh, take some time and, and think about all the journey that we've made on it through the path of all these pieces of the story. And it's summarized very nicely in this part of the path. But I love the way they've taken the path book and taken all of this stuff that's in the Bible and all these pieces, pull it together in this wonderful tapestry. And you really have a view of the the picture that uh, uh, that we're trying to get our arms around. That's the problem with me. I start with the pictures and I sit with the with the Bible and and think about it. And then I go on to the next picture, but I haven't ever had done a very good job of pulling all the pieces together. And that's what I love about what's happening with the path. So my question to you, then, Justin, is on all this beautiful tapestry and all these beautiful lessons, how are you and how are we to be applying this whole passage, this whole chapter, to our lives as Christians? Yeah. Well, thank you take all this and realize as we go and that's probably where we need to think about it because you go back and read some of these prophets and this idea of the main guys and then you have the minor prophets and that's only because of the length of the scroll it's not that they weren't important and i love what we do in the very last book of the old testament uh, with the book of Malachi and Malachi 3 and says and it starts off with this wonderful link to what you're talking about it says I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me and suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple the messenger of the covenant uh, whom you desire will come, says the Lord. And of course, who are they talking about in that passage? And I think another thing, building off what you were talking about, parts of tradition. Uh, I think the Jews had the traditions that they carried to Babylon and carried back, and it was instrumental in their continuation as a as a as a culture. And in our mind, in my mind, the fact that we study, we study the Bible, the fact we have traditions in our liturgy, we have traditions in our songs, and those reinforce our faith. And and I'm, I'm just saying, so that's a take, for me, that's a takeaway. Uh, some, some folks do not use those same traditions that we do. Well, right, but tradition, that, no, I agree with you about traditions, but one thought I had about this was that there, fortunately, were people who were listening to God and came, when God called them, they came forward. Uh, 
we're going to always seem to make the same mistakes. So hopefully, somebody will keep listening to God and come forward. Well, that's the important part of having the prophets that those that uh, yeah. you had the prophets that kind of kept things in balance. I think. Uh, I think to your point, what that passage in in Malachi is talking about is John the Baptist coming of Jesus, and that is such a wonderful tie because you're talk here. You're at the year 400 BC, and you got 400 years with no prophets at all. And then suddenly, here's the story of Jesus. And I said, it's a wonderful way of tying all this together and getting ready for the greatest story that's ever been told. And I don't know, it's just, just such a wonderful journey. I have this little icon on my study. And this is a, one of the prophet panels from the Shark Cathedral. This is Jeremiah. And Luke is sitting on his shoulders. And the quote is, we're but dwarfs sitting on the shoulders of giants. And that to me kind of sums the bridge between these Old Testament prophets to what's going to happen with the new. But this wouldn't be possible without the foundation that Isaiah and Jeremiah, all of these are leaning forward to what's going to happen into this New Testament story. And that's a great way to go next time. The path in the beginning of the next chapter does a beautiful job in that first paragraph of chapter 16. And they tie the history together in a, in a wonderful paragraph. And it just uh, kind of blows me out of the water that you can finally <laughs> tell this stuff in... <laughs> one paragraph and tie a whole lot of history about 400 years nearly 400 years have passed and the people of god resettled in the and rebuilt the land that god promised them it was a time of relative peace and prosperity as the people established their their lives and their worship in the political arena the persians were replaced by the greeks after the conquest of Alexander the Great and the first of the Ptolemies in Egypt and then the Seleucids of Syria were given governance over the land of the Jewish the people had lived. And then in 63 BC, General Pompey conquers Palestine and the Roman rule begins. That's a wonderful paragraph. If you ever want to summarize 400 years of history, <laughs> that's the paragraph. And that's what it, it's also right here. Yeah. This, this is so helpful. The, just read that. That chart comes out of the big atlas of, of it, and it's so heavy I can't even lift it off my shelf. But I find this chart has been my EFM salvation trying to tie all these pieces together. So anyway, thank you all very much. I really Appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's great. And next Sunday, we will be beginning our study of the New Testament and of the gospel. So if anybody would like to lead that discussion, let me know. Uh, if not, uh, we will draw lots to select one. <laughs> yeah. See you all. So Dave, the word redacted. Uh huh. It's funny to me that when these people send out a document that they online through most of the stuff in it, so you can't read it. Yeah, we usually assume that means they took out the curse words or. Sometimes it's the words you want to read that they've marked out. Yeah. They don't want you to know what they said. Is that a, a proper sure. application of that word redacted? Sure. I mean, the, the time that I remember hearing that a lot was when the Nixon tapes were right. being transcriptions were coming out. Right. And we talked about all the redacted right. uh, stuff. So the word so. means rewritten. What does redacted? I don't. I think redact is probably from the from the word for hand. So my, my guess is that rewritten is actually a pretty yeah. good approximation of the think, etymology of the word. I don't know what the etymology is. In fact, it sounds like fixated. No, it's it's a common word today in in, uh, in legal in legal lexicon. Uh, like we we had a our water company out there had a 
that um, report developed, had a, some people came in and looked at the system and all that, and they wrote a report. And one of our neighbors wanted to see the report, and they wouldn't give it to him. Mm -hmm. So uh, he sued them, and they took it to the to the DA, and the DA said it's a security issue. And it three four, they gave him the stuff three fourths of it was yeah. so yeah. it misused sometimes. Yeah, sometimes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and the book of Esther is the most redacted book in the Bible. Is it really okay? Really. Redacted, rewritten. It's an interesting story. This is probably a 